We're pleased to be joined today by Flo Groberg, a decorated veteran of our nation's armed forces, and someone who I think has a, a very unique story to share with us as we consider today's theme of reflection and choice. Flo, this wasn't the beginning of your journey, but certainly an important moment when you took an oath to join the armed forces of the United States uh, to protect the Constitution against uh, its enemies. And uh, I wanted you, if you would, just to reflect on what that oath meant to you at the time and how your understanding of that oath has evolved today. You know, back in 2008 uh, at Fort Meade in Maryland, I took an oath to join the United States Army. And to me, that was one of the most important moments of my life, specifically because at that moment, it gave me the right to to join our armed forces, but also to earn the right to call myself an American. As an immigrant, as a naturalized citizen, when my country, my, my newly adopted country is at war, the fact that I, as one of its citizens, was not involved in being a part of that solution, that didn't sit well with me. So I had to go earn it. I had to go earn the right to call myself an American. And that meant to join its armed forces and, and serve my nation. So raising my right hand was such an honor and a privilege, uh, fully understanding that I was now committing myself to a different life. That's, that's for sure. Uh, but most importantly, that I was committing uh, myself to something greater than just me. It's something that I look back at and, man, am I excited that I'd made that choice. It, it, it made me a man and gave me a foundation that I, I live by and through um, today. Uh, it also gave me the opportunity to challenge myself in ways that it, I, I don't think I could, have, I could have ever challenged myself at. Well, so let's go back a little further to where it did start. Uh, you, you shared that you weren't always here. Can you tell us a bit of your early story and particularly some of those moments that may have shaped your character and, and helped you see something that made you want to be here. Absolutely. It's, I, I was born in France and just at the outskirts of Paris. Um, I lived, uh, lived there till I was 11 years old. I did have a stint in Spain for a year there. I'm adopted, which is a big deal for me uh, because that meant that two individuals chose me to be their son. Uh, and I don't take that for granted. Uh, it means a lot to me. And, and that's something that throughout my life as a young man, when I found out and later on as, a, as an adult, I paid really close attention to because I wanted to make sure that those two individuals are always proud of me and what I bring to them and how I represent them because they didn't have to pick me. Uh, they didn't have to raise me and go through all the things that they've gone through, specifically my mother. It gave me this, this mindset of I always need to be the hardest working person in the room um, because I need to earn it. Just the same mindset that I had about earning the right to call myself an American and taking that oath. But when I was 11, we had the opportunity to move to the United States. I didn't speak English. So coming here to the United States was definitely a change in culture. Uh, but it's something that I, I, I was incredibly excited about. Uh, the idea of, of moving here and getting to see even the yellow buses, things like we didn't have in France, uh, that you only saw movies or TV shows. It was just super exciting for a young kid. Uh, and when I got here, obviously, it was definitely a culture change, uh, or I've probably the, the more accurate saying is a culture shock. Uh, everything was bigger. I think everything moved slower. Uh, coming from Paris to the outskirts of Chicago, uh, I mean, the suburbs of Chicago and Palatine, Illinois, that was a shock. Uh, and of course, not speaking the language, but my father uh, will, has always been a man of very few words, but a lot of direction and very direct direction. He didn't hold my hand uh, the way you, I guess you would expect a father to do so to a, a younger child, specifically because we were at rough times. What he allowed me to do is to go jump right into things and fall on my face and learn the lessons from it. And some people might look back and say, whoa, that's really not cool. Like, why would your dad do that? Well, it's not like my dad just let me do it by myself. He would give me instruction and expect me to follow his instructions. But what he instilled in me at a young age is courage. Uh, courage to go do things that are uncomfortable, to step outside of my comfort zone. And that started with being 11 years old, going to the pool. I'll never forget this. He, he told me to get out of the house. Um, we had a duplex uh, town home, I guess. And he said, go to the, you know, he gave me a card and he gave me instruction on how to get to the local pool to walk there. And he expected me to go give, you know, make friends. And I told him at that time, I said, look, man, like I, uh, I don't speak this language. I don't know anyone. Why don't you come with me? 
And then he said to me, literally what I explained earlier, I'm not going to hold your hand the rest of your life. Sometimes you're going to have to take chances. You're going to have to go do things that don't feel that are a little bit difficult or make you feel uncomfortable, but that's how you're going to learn. So go figure out how to speak this language, meet some new friends, and then go be a kid. So I was really confused at that time, but that was a really important lesson that I remember to this day because that was the first time in my life where I really felt like on my own and challenged. And it sounds so trivial to talk about going to the pool, but when you don't speak a language um, and then you try to interact with a bunch of strangers in a foreign country by yourself at 11 years old, yeah, that's weird. So I did it and I followed the instructions. I made friends that day. Uh, I think people were probably really intrigued with the fact that I spoke French and didn't speak English. So like that's easy to make friends there. Or maybe they're making fun of me. I don't remember. Either way, I, I love the pool. I had, I, you know, and I was a really good soccer player. So with those kids, we started playing soccer, and I became, I made, made, made a lot of new friends. You know, I went to an Eng- I went to French international school and then transitioned to an American school. And in the American school, I was in English as a second language, and that's when I learned English rapidly because when you're force fed a language. Um, in an environment where you don't have any other choices but to learn quite rapidly. Uh, you learn rapidly. And that to me was one of those things, again, where I felt really uncomfortable because I was in English as a second language for my English classes, but I was with every other kid in you know history, science, math, PE, whatever those courses are. All that really challenged me in ways that I think really paid dividend later on in life, specifically when I was in Afghanistan, because I was able to be exposed at an early age to multiple different cultures, multiple different languages, uh, I was able to be put in an uncomfortable, uncomfortable situation where you have to fit in. You have to find ways to fit in. Um, but most importantly, you have to find ways to communicate. But probably something, the most important thing that happened in my childhood was um, in 1996, in February 1996, after we had just moved to, to Maryland, uh, my uncle was killed by a terrorist organization called the GIA. Uh, my uncle was living in North Africa at the time in Alger- Algeria. And he had just joined the military a few years prior, about five, six years prior, uh, to go fight against this terrorist organization predecessor to Al-Qaeda, uh, who had come into this North African, westernized type country where men and women drank. They went out to nightclubs. You know, women didn't have to wear any headscarf. They didn't want to. They can go study, whatever it was, right? It was just a westernized North African Arab country. And then these folks wanted to bring in Sharia law. And so on February 6, 1996, he was um, during a ceasefire to observe Ramadan, of all things. My uncle was uh, was attacked and he was killed. When that news was passed down to me the following day or so back here in the United States by my father, it, it sent shockwaves to my system, specifically because that uncle was my favorite person in the world outside of my parents. Uh, he's... He's the one that I remember being three years old and going to the beach with, just you know, hanging out with him, being in his arms. Always wanted to follow him and anno- probably really annoying. I kind of think of it now. Uh, always wanted to be around him. And and for those years, my, my early childhood years, he was the who I wanted to emulate and be like. And so the fact that my favorite person, who was always the sweetest person to me, was now killed by other folks, and in the matter that he was killed, that I'd rather not share on this video, um, was was atrocious and it was horrible. That gave me a very early understanding and reality of the evil in this world. And that shaped my, my youth in a way that potentially wouldn't have happened because of that. Uh, and it made me realize at a young age that I more than likely was going to follow in his footsteps, also my father's footsteps, and join the military um, and, and fight those type of individuals. So, you know, you're talking about being 12 years old and you already know in a way what you want to do. And then finally, the last piece, this is uh, icing on the cake, is I was naturalized on February 1st, in February 20, 2001. Seven months later, 9-11 happens. And the same type of individuals that terrorized my family, killed my uncle, now I have attacked my new adopted country and killed, you know, thousands of my brothers and sisters. And so that was the, the final decision point. Um, that was the, 
it, just, it cemented my path at that moment. And I knew no matter what, I was going to join the military and be a part of that solution. You've painted a really um, detailed picture of how your life experiences around you kind of formed and shaped your character. As you look back now as an adult, what kinds of things do you think young people need to learn? What kinds of values should they be seeking to incorporate into their character? Well, I think the first one should be respect. Uh, respect of, of, and not just, you know, I love respect to your elders, right? Because there was, they, they have so much experiences, they're gonna teach you something, right? No matter whether or not you wanna hear it, they're gonna teach you something that's incredibly valuable. And more than likely, I will say almost a guarantee, you will not understand that value until later on in life. Um, you might pick it up on a thing or two, especially when you're young, uh, but it, it's just it's going to make a heck of a lot more sense later on in life when you're like, oh, that's what she meant. Well, that's what he meant. Now I get it. And so I think respect is such a big thing that um, we don't we, we believe we we practice a lot of times. We believe that, you know, that we are incredibly respectful individuals. But if you really take a step back and replay, if you could replay some of your inter interactions, some of your thoughts, you're going to see that this is something that we always need to work on. The other one is integrity. I, I use this example as, as an easy one for people to digest. And that is when I ran track, I was, a, I was a, a soccer player and I was a track athlete. Every Sunday was the day of recovery uh, for a long run, not recovery. But it was the only day during a week that you didn't have organized practice majority of the time, right? Unless summers would get together. But this is, was a day where you could go as you know with your teammates and go for a 15, 20 mile run, or you could do it on your own. No one really checked in on you. But as my coach used to say, that day is the most important day of the week. Because that's the day where you're gonna find out whether or not you want it. Because I'm not checking up on you. So you're gonna have to have the integrity self-integrity and self-respect as well to go do the work when no one's watching. You know, it's really easy. It sounds okay. All right, whatever. Just go, go for a run. You're in college. You're young, right? Sometimes you just had a track meet or a cross country meet the day before. So you're tired and you know, you want to over, you want to sleep in a little bit. It's Sunday. You deserve that, right? Well, you know, you sleep in, you sleep until nine and you get up and your friends are here like, hey, let's go get some breakfast. You're like, no, I got to go run 15 miles. It's going to take me two plus hours, right? Or 20 miles. And then you find an excuse not to do it. I didn't want to live like that. I had this mindset that if I don't do my run on Sunday, I'm not letting myself down. I'm not even letting just my coach down. I'm letting my team down. Because that means that I missed one of the most important key components of my success and the team's success because I decided to be lazy or I decided to 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 take a, a rest day when, when everybody else is working hard, right? And so though that was probably the hardest things for me to do, I would get up at six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, even if I went to sleep at two. Um, and so I got a little bit smart about that as years went on. But I would get up at six o'clock in the morning and I would go on my 15 to 20 mile run. And every time I hated the start of that run, never did I enjoy it. Cause I, I didn't enjoy running long distance. I was a middle distance, a mile or two mile. But every time I was done with that run, it made that Sunday amazing. That built discipline that played massive dividends later on in my life when I was in the military, when I went to ranger school and I had you know, you, you, you're you exhausted, you're tired, you're hungry, um, and you're supposed to be doing your part on, you know, on an, at, at two o'clock in the morning, taking a knee and, and covering your sector. And instead of taking a nap because no one's around to watch me, I had the same type of mindset that was trained through my years in college of, I'm going to do the right thing when no one's watching. Because I know that if I don't, I'm going to let these folks down. I'm going to let my teammates down. Integrity, Self-discipline are such important traits and character traits that I worked really hard on. And by the way, it's not like I said those words when I was doing them. It was just the motions. It was what made sense to me um, or who I wanted to be as an individual. And I think the last piece is the respect also brought a respect to the, towards the enemy in combat. Having respect for your enemy keeps you honest, also keeps you attentive, and it keeps you ready. 
Uh, it doesn't, it, it really kicks in or kicks out more accurately complacency. We've talked a lot about your choices and the things that have shaped that. As you've learned more about the history of your adopted country, are there any particular stories where others made choices that have been meaningful or inspiring to you? First of all, going back to the beginning, to me, uh, you know, George Washington and the decisions that he made with, you know, and bringing in the militia and being able to to work in a, against all odds, against an enemy force that it was overwhelming, but also did not have respect, right, for against us. And so I think they took us, they underestimated us too often. But his, his leadership characteristics really, and the way he, he led and, and motivated folks and trusted some of his advisors in the way he operated, that gave me a really understanding and a clue of, of the, just the American spirit. Uh, we come, we've, we've always been, well, not anymore, but for the longest time, we were what we were perceived as almost underdogs. Uh, young country, uh, people call us a little bit arrogant at times, four of ourselves. But one thing that we do better than everyone, anyone else is, my goodness, we are so darn patriotic. We are so patriotic. Um, we're so patriotic that when we're not in a conflict, we start fighting against each other. Uh, and so you kind of look at 9-11, you look at, uh, heck, go back to 19, you know, 1941, December 7, 1941, uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, and then you kind of look at that country. We were probably when the World War II started. I always mess these numbers up so you can fact check me later. But the 33rd world power on the military side at the time, maybe maybe a little bit, maybe top 30. But we were really, we, we, we weren't doing too well. Um, and by... I think 19, by, the, by 1942, a year after Pearl Harbor, we're number two. Uh, you know, this country overnight after we were attacked, just flipped a switch and put all of our differences aside. So forget the Great Depression. It was all about making sure that whoever attacked us paid the price. You know, to say awakening a sleeping giant uh, is that saying right there. But the reality is what it did is, is it gave us the... Uh, negative situation forced us to ally with each other to start respecting each other and working with each other on a common goal and when the americans do this we are absolutely without a doubt second to none unstoppable it is the way we you know when we fought against the british empire uh that is what we walked that is how we did it we took the hard route uh we did the unthinkable to to beat one of the the, the world power at the time and that's something that I look back and then you go from the stories that we have in this nation. Um, you know, I work for the Boeing company, but, you know, Boeing uh, to to Martin Luther King uh, to Reagan and what he did during the Cold War. And these are really important. His speeches that he made that I watch all the time because they're so motivating, but impactful, but also make so much sense of the situation at the time, but now you go back and you, re you listen to these speeches and they still make sense today with what we're facing and the threats we're facing. I didn't want to get really into more military folks, but I'm a history buff, uh, you know, Doolittle's. The fact that I'm even in the same in a safe society as Doolittle and Audie Murphy is absolutely completely ludicrous and crazy to me because there's no way that I could ever put myself in the same sense as these, you know, warriors. Uh, but it's, uh, it's fascinating that there's so many points of motivations throughout our history that have made me so proud to be an American, but also more importantly, giving me a lot of reasons to make sure that um, I never took a day off. Flo, you've said a lot of inspiring things here and um, just your example of service to our country for which we, we thank you is, is inspiring in itself. Not everybody is going to have the same opportunity as you did to serve the nation in that particular way. What would you encourage young people to do? Um, how would you encourage them to serve one another in their community to help make the country stronger? One, the, the first thing that I would say that's really important, um, you're probably not going to expect me to say that. And as these young individuals who are watching this video, probably not going to expect me to say that is uh, learn the art of listening. I think listening to each other, if I, you know what, forget, don't even do any community service. I don't really care. 
Uh, don't don't even join any other organization. Don't join the military. It's okay. Uh, if you just worked on listening to other people and being compassionate enough to hear them out without bringing upon judgment or your own judgment upon them, and by being just a little bit of curious of why they're thinking a certain way, we live we live in such a better world. We have lost the appetite to listen to each other attentively. Uh, we seem to always want to inject our own thoughts and comments and voice and beliefs on each, into each other. And we're no longer capable of taking a step back and absorbing what someone else potentially different of opinion is of all about. And so, of course, I want you to go out there and serve your community as best as you can. And things that are you're passionate about it isn't, you know, it, it can be uh, painting a, a home or working in a homeless shelter or going to a children's hospital and reading books to kids or picking up trash on the side road. That, absolutely. But why don't we just go back to the basics and let's learn to listen to each other again? My goodness, if we could just do that, things would turn around so much faster and this animosity that we're feeling and not just in our country, you got to start opening up and look at the world and what's happening around the world as well uh, would more than likely dissipate a little bit uh, just because we would just in this case act more like what we're supposed to, how we're supposed to act as human beings and respectful members of society. Is there anything else that you want to say or have I kind of given you the right chances to get that out? I am absolutely grateful and humbled that this country gave me the opportunity to serve uh, its nation, uh, wear its colors, and most importantly, be lead and be led by some of the finest men and women that I've ever met. And that's something I don't take for granted. So as an immigrant, I appreciate the fact that I can call myself an American. And I just hope that everyone that's you know, who is American um, can take a step back and, and really appreciate how lucky we are. Um, and how blessed we are. Paul, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks, Stan.